and I'm really delighted uh, to be uh, here at International House. Uh, I um, journeyed all the way from Palo Alto. It's really quite a culture shock to cross the bay, but I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, um, I've only lived in the Bay Area for a little over a year, so uh, all of this uh, is, is, uh, uh, is a, uh, a new country to me, so I'm really appreciative to get uh, invitations like this. So what I'm going to do tonight is to talk about the origins of political order. Uh, this is the first volume of two. This one takes you roughly from primates up until the French Revolution, uh, and volume two hopefully will get you from the French Revolution uh, up to the present, although hopefully, uh, especially in the question and answer, I think a lot of what I'm going to say about the origins of political order are very much related to current questions like the Arab Spring, like the future of China, even the future of the United States. And so uh, we will get into contemporary events. Now, the reason that I wrote this book was fairly straightforward. I was running an international development program focusing on poor countries, and I'd spent a lot of time during uh, the years after September 11th thinking about failed states like Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Haiti, uh, uh, and the like. And the problem uh, uh, of how to actually rebuild political institutions in societies like that was a front and center issue in American foreign policy. The way I put it in the book was this was the problem of getting to Denmark, where Denmark is actually not a real country. It's kind of a symbol for good government, meaning it's democratic, low levels of corruption, prosperous, uh, well-managed. And you start with something like Somalia or Haiti or Afghanistan, and we're constantly trying to say, well, hi, you know, it doesn't look very much like Denmark, and we'd really like it to, uh, to be like that, and why are we having so much trouble uh, getting it there? And I think part of the reason that we are having this trouble is that we do not understand how Denmark got to be Denmark. Now, I happen to know this is the truth because I had a visiting professorship for the past few years at a Danish university, Aarhus University, and so I've been going back and forth every year a couple times uh, a year to uh, Denmark, and believe me, the Danes don't understand how they got to be Denmark. Uh, and so I think that there's been a process of historical amnesia that the creation of modern political institutions was such a long, difficult, and violent process, and in a sense, we who take government for granted uh, uh, don't appreciate how difficult it was to get to the state that we are today. Uh, in the United States, we've got this very anti-government, anti-statist uh, political culture for a whole variety of reasons. But the truth of the matter is, if you want to see a weak state where the government doesn't get in the way of anyone, go to Afghanistan, because that's what you've got there. Uh, and, and, and so this hidden infrastructure of, of politics is one that I think uh, we should be grateful for, but we need to understand where that came from. The other uh, important purpose of this book was I didn't want to do one of these rise of Western civilization types of stories uh, because I actually think that the paradigmatic country that's usually the hero of the story is England. And for reasons that I'll get into, I think that England's modernization was actually a very peculiar one that will not be duplicated anytime soon by any other society uh, in the world. And so my story actually starts with China, uh, because for reasons I'll shortly explain, I believe that China never got adequate credit for being the first society to create not a state, because that existed elsewhere, but the first society to create a modern state. And in some sense, that's still what the Chinese uh, are good at. All right, so. I'm a professor, so I have to begin with a couple of definitions, unfortunately, but I hope you bear with me, because when I talk about political institutions and political order, I'm speaking about something very specific. I believe that all modern liberal democracies are based on three baskets of basic institutions. So the first is the state itself. The state is a hierarchical uh, organization that deploys a legitimate monopoly of force uh, over a defined territory where it can set the rules, and it does it with the consent of the people that live in that territory. That you might recognize as Max Weber, the uh, famous uh, German sociologist definition of a state. So if you think about it, the state is all about power. It's all about concentrating power and being able to use it to make people do what the state 
uh, wants you to do. Second important set of institutions is under the heading of the rule of law. Now there are as many definitions of the rule of law, I think, as there are law school professors in some respects. Uh, it can mean simple law and order. It can mean the diktat of you know, the government. In my definition of the, the rule of law, uh, what that is is a set of rules, formal rules, uh, that embody a community sense of justice, rules of justice, but it has to be higher than the will of whoever is running the government at any given point, whether that is a king, a monarch, a president, a prime minister, a dictator, what will. If you're a dictator, you're not going to follow the rule of law. And the point of the rule of law is, if you're the head of state and you get to make up the rules as you go along, that's not the rule of law. So the rule of law, that second important institution, is a constraint on the concentrated power represented by the state. Right? The third set of institutions are institutions of accountability, meaning the state ought to reflect a sense of common good. It ought to reflect the interest of the population rather than the narrow interest of whoever happens to be running uh, the state at that particular time. Today, we understand accountability in terms of multi-party, regular, free and fair uh, elections by which we can get rid of bad leaders that we don't uh, like and hold them accountable. Uh, I prefer a broader definition of accountability because I think that governments can be accountable even in the absence of uh, elections. They can be morally accountable, and we'll see this is actually important in the Chinese uh, uh, tradition because they didn't have uh, uh, formal elections or, or formal uh, types uh, of accountability. And in any case, uh, my first example of accountable government anywhere in the world was the English Parliament after the glorious revolution of 1688-89, that was not a democratic parliament. It only represented maybe 10% of the wealthiest uh, residents of, of England. Uh, and yet the king agreed that he was accountable to that parliament and that established the precedent for modern democracy. All right. So the state which is concentrating power, rule of law and accountability, the first one concentrates power, the second two uh, restrict power, they restrain power, and one of the miracles, I think, of modern politics is you can have incredibly powerful states. So President Obama could nuke the rest of the world if he, you know, I mean, he's got the capability of doing that. It doesn't happen because that power is uh, constrained by institutions. And how you achieve that balance historically, get to that point, I think, is uh, an interesting story. So I'm going to tell you some stories out of each of those three baskets, beginning with the story of the state. Uh, I actually uh, begin with uh, a lot of stories about primate behavior and chimpanzees because actually I believe that there is a biological basis for human politics. Uh, there are two principles that biologists point to uh, as virtually universal, grounded in our you know, genome, uh, that make human beings, not isolated individuals, but social animals uh, right from the beginning. The first is what the biologists call principle of kin selection, meaning that you favor genetic relatives in proportion to the number of genes that you share with them. So in other words, it is a principle of nepotism. The other biological principle that's critical is a principle of reciprocal altruism. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Now, these are biological in the following sense. No child, no human child uh, born anywhere has to be taught these behaviors. Uh, they come naturally, they exist in all of the primates that, that preceded uh, the emergence of modern uh, human beings. Primate societies organize themselves according to these principles. And in some sense, I think that it is the default form of human sociability, what I label patrimonialism, meaning we have this natural tendency to favor friends and family over other types of people, people that we've dealt with directly, this close uh, circle around us. And in some sense, you cannot have politics and you can't have modern politics unless you get past this principle, unless you organize societies on a much broader scale, so you treat them impersonally uh, and therefore a state may be based on a family, on a ruling dynasty, and it may be organized you know, by kin groups and, and patronage and so forth. 
but a modern state has to be impersonal. It has to be based on a non-kinship-based uh, principle of citizenship where the ruler treats people uh, on, an, on, a, on, a, uh, on an even and equal uh, basis, all right? So the question is, everybody at one point, no matter what culture they come from, is organized at some stage uh, in their social development in a tribal uh, uh, system, meaning that people trace uh, ancestry to a, a, a common um, ancestor, maybe three, four, or five generations uh, removed. This is true of the Germanic barbarians that are the precursors of modern Europeans. It's true of Africans. It's true of Arabs. It's true of Chinese. It's true of Indians. You know, there isn't a society that didn't go through this stage of organization. How do you get a state out of this? Uh, the answer is pretty simple. It is war, unfortunately. And this is actually one of the tragic um, characteristics of human evolution that the best things, in a sense, are, you know, the, the higher forms of social organization are driven by our baser, um, <clears throat> uh, our baser instincts. And you see this process happening in China. Uh, in China, we don't associate the Chinese with being, you know, terribly militaristic uh, uh, in, 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 in present-day society. But prior to the formation of a unified Chinese state in the year 221 BC, the beginning of the Qin Dynasty, the Chinese went through approximately 500 years of continuous warfare from about the 7th century BC up until uh, the 3rd century. And in this process, at the beginning of that period, uh, the, 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 the Zhou Dynasty, they had maybe you know, 10,000 political units. Basically, they're more like tribal units. Uh, at the beginning of the Warring States period, that had all been crunched down to seven states. And at the end of that process, one single state, the, the state of Qin, from which the word China is, is derived, ended up victorious, unified what's now northern China, the, the Yellow River Valley, and produced the first Chinese uh, empire. And that process of state formation went as follows. You need to raise an army because you're going to be annihilated if you don't do that. Uh, you stop using aristocrats riding chariots. You start recruiting peasants in infantry armies. To do that, you need taxation. To get taxation, you need a bureaucracy to collect the taxes uh, and to administer it. And all of this creates pressure. And furthermore, it creates pressure for impersonal government because it turns out that if you're uh, one of the kings of one of these Chinese states, and you hire your cousin, who's a complete you know, nincompoop, to run your armies, you're going to get defeated, and you're going to get uh, killed. And so the idea that you should recruit people on the basis of examinations and demonstrated merit gets started in the crucible of this existential, uh, you know, multi-century conflict uh, between, these, uh, between these Chinese states. And by the way, this is a pr process that many other later societies have had to go through. Beginning of the Civil War, uh, many of the Union generals that Abraham Lincoln appointed were patronage positions. Uh, they lost some really big battles early on in the Civil War, and it was only gradually that he began to realize that if you don't you know, uh, 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 promote people like Grant that could actually win battles that, that the Union side uh, was going to lose. So the, principle of merit, you know, is one that in a sense constantly has to be uh, reasserted in human politics. The Chinese government creates a centralized, bureaucratic, impersonal, very modern looking state in the third century BC. It's administered uh, centrally by a whole hierarchy of uh, bureaucrats, just like, you know, uh, American bureaucrats, they all have, you know, who have a general service schedule, they, you know, they've got these ranks and promotions. Uh, and this is pretty much the same kind of government that the Chinese are good at today. Under the Communist Party, they do high-quality, centralized, bureaucratic uh, administration. Uh, and one of the questions we're going to pose at the end of the talk is, you know, how does that stack up against uh, an American system? Because it's, it's very different from, from the West. The Chinese never developed rule of law, and they never developed accountable government. Right? They didn't develop the rule of law in my, well, uh, l let me, I'll, I'll get to that because that's the next uh, basket of issues. But the, the, the fact that they've got this very powerful state not constrained by either law or accountability institutions means that that state is capable of incredible uh, tyranny. In fact, a modern state that's, that's you know, uh, is, is capable of greater tyranny 
than a less developed one if it's not checked by these other uh, institutions. And that, you know, is, is one incredibly important historical uh, case of where a modern state uh, comes from. Now, when we move on to the rule of law, I said the rule of law is a set of rules that constrains the power of the state uh, according to the moral norms held by the community. So you ask yourself, where in the world does such a set of rules ever come from in any society? And the obvious answer to that is it comes out of religion uh, because it is religion that provides moral rules which in very many uh, uh, cultural traditions is not made up by the rulers, it is made up by a cadre of priests, interpreters, jurists, judges, and their authority in most cases is superior to that of whoever happens to be running uh, the state at, at any given point. This is true in ancient Israel, it is true in the Western Christian tradition, it is true in Islam, and it is true in Hinduism. The only world civilization that never developed a rule of law in this particular sense was China, and I believe, or what I argue in the book is, the reason I didn't develop it is there's no, there's never really been a transcendental religion in China. There's never been anything like the class of Brahmins in, uh, in, in India or the Catholic Church uh, in the West or the ulama in uh, Islam that could act as a check on executive power uh, in a Chinese context. Uh, law for the Chinese was always positive law. It was whatever the uh, emperor uh, wanted. Now, in the West, I think law developed at a very early stage, and this is something that I think a lot of um, uh, Europeans don't understand about their own society. The first of these three institutions to develop was not the state, it was actually legal institutions. This all happened actually in the 11th century uh, when you had this titanic struggle. Uh, at that point, the Catholic Church, you know, priests and bishops could marry, uh, they could um, uh, have families, they could pass down their benefices uh, to their children. You had a, um, you know, a titanically willed pope, Pope Gregory VII, who in some sense was a precursor of Martin Luther, who decided the church, as long as was organized according to this patrimonial principle where the family was the main loyalty of priests and bishops, could never get its own house in order and therefore could never exert the kind of moral authority over European society that, you know, that, that the church believed uh, it, it, it ought to. And he launched this you know, big struggle within the church uh, for celibacy of the priesthood. And so actually celibacy of the priesthood is not something I think that comes out of the Bible. It actually was a very practical uh, response to nepotism uh, really within, uh, within the church. He also launches this big war against the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry IV. Uh, he excommunicates the emperor, forces him to come uh, to Canossa to uh, uh, seek uh, absolution. But the main issue that he was seeking was to get the church out from under the heel of secular authorities so it could appoint its own priests and bishops. Uh, again, they have to fight. You know, he has some allies in southern Germany. Uh, they fight a war that goes on for two uh, generations, and then finally, uh, early in the 12th century, the Concord out of Worms is signed, in which uh, the church is allowed to appoint its own, uh, its own priests and bishops. And at that point, the church, uh, in, in, as part of the struggle, revives uh, the Justinian Code. This was a 6th century Roman codification of all of the hitherto existing Roman law. They find it in an attic uh, in northern Italy. They start teaching this in this famous law school in Bologna, Italy, uh, to which students from all over Europe begin to go. And the origins of the civil code, which is really the major legal system everywhere in Europe except uh, in, um, in Britain, uh, has its origins uh, in the revival uh, of this code. And so all of a sudden you've really got a legal order, a transnational legal order in Europe based on the revival of Roman law taught to university students and presided over by an ecclesiastical hierarchy that is entirely separate from political power. And so the Catholic Church, in a certain sense, is responsible for laying the foundations for an independent uh, rule of law that can act as a break on, uh, break on authority. And so, in many respects, you know, <laughs> Catholic Church wasn't trying to do this. That wasn't their intention. They actually wanted to just 
morally regulate Europe and, and get power for themselves. But one of the consequences, the long-term consequences, is that the Europeans actually had law before any European monarch got it into his head to act like a Chinese emperor and try to concentrate power in a big bureaucratic state. That didn't happen until the 16th, 17th centuries. And then when they tried to do this, they had to do this against the background of a pre-existing legal system that put all sorts of constraints uh, in the way of their ability to just, you know, for example, kill uh, whatever elite opponent uh, uh, they ran into, the way a Chinese emperor could get rid of all of his uh, opponents. And so the rule of law, I think, in that Western European tradition is very deeply rooted. Now, final issue is democracy. Where does democracy actually come from? Uh, some people sort of, I think, following Tocqueville in, in many ways, think that it's just a matter of ideas, that this idea of equality gets out in the world, it gathers momentum, no one can stop it, and then you get uh, to the United States and, and modernity and so forth. In fact, uh, I would argue that the only reason we have democracy in the world today is due to a funny historical accident, which is the survival of a peculiar feudal institution into modern times that then morphs into modern electoral democracy. Every European state at the end of the Middle Ages had an institution known as Cortes in Spain, Parliament in uh, England, the Diet in, in, in Hungary uh, and Poland, Ziemski Sobor in, in, in Russia. Uh, all of these were traditional bodies of notables representing the clergy, uh, the uh, aristocracy, sometimes the, the, the bourgeoisie uh, that the king had to go to in order to get permission to raise taxes. And beginning at the end of the 16th century, all of these European monarchs then get it into their heads that they are going to act like a Chinese emperor. They're going to get rid of these estates, centralize power, create a centralized bureaucracy, and basically run the entire country uh, as a autocratic uh, centralized tyranny. And everywhere there's a big struggle between the state on the one hand, the monarch on the one hand, and the estates. There's one country in which the parliament, the estate side of that conflict, is sufficiently cohesive, uh, holds together, fights a civil war with the king, defeats him, lops off his head. This is Charles I, the, the uh, Stuart king, in 16, um, at the end of the 1640s. He then, they then depose a second uh, king, James II, in the Glorious Revolution, and they come to a constitutional settlement in which William of Orange is brought from Holland, a pretender uh, to the English throne, and he's made the English king on the condition that he accept a constitution that embeds the principle no taxation without representation. All right? And that is really the beginnings of accountable government. The ability, the need of kings to tax uh, is critical to the power that that gives their population to actually constrain the king. One of the reasons that oil-rich countries today tend not to be democracies is they don't have to tax anybody. You know, they just get this money flowing out of the ground and so they can do whatever they want with it. They don't actually have to go to their citizens and say, you know, I want to raise your taxes in order to build a school or a hospital or something else. But in England, that was, uh, uh, that was the case and it is only uh, 100 years uh, less than 100 years until the American Revolution, uh, 1776, the founding of the American Republic. Uh, in fact, John Locke, the philosopher who was critical in uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, in the way that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he was a participant. He went with William of Orange uh, from the Netherlands back to uh, England, uh, and he basically made the argument in the Second Treatise of Government that the legitimacy of government is based on the consent of the governed. So those two principles, no taxation without representation, uh, legitimacy lies in the consent of the governed. These become the founding principles of the American Republic. Because there is a deeply rooted common law that protects property rights, uh, these societies are among the first to industrialize. They get extremely rich. They go on to conquer you know, a good part of the world, uh, and I think that really explains the spread of this particular uh, democratic uh, uh, form of government uh, that is now at least in form uh, shared by uh, some 120 of the 180 odd uh, countries around the world. And so you can see that 
a lot of this is pretty accidental. You know, rule of law coming out of the Catholic Church, um, democracy coming out of feudal institutions. History does not proceed in any uh, kind of uh, linear or predictable manner. So uh, one of the questions then is, how does this actually relevant to anything that's going on uh, right now? Because as I said, the story in this first volume really ends in 1776 or 1789. <clears throat> uh, and let me just suggest a couple of, uh, a couple of ways in which it is. First of all, uh, China and India, so every business school in the country has been talking about emerging markets and who's going to do better, uh, China or India. So what's the difference between these two societies? Well, if you look at Chinese history, they unify in the third century BC. They fall apart four centuries later, but basically for the next 2,000 years, the default condition of China is to be a unified, authoritarian, centralized, bureaucratically run uh, society. If you look at Indian history over that same 2,300 year period, it's almost the mirror image. That is to say, India is only unified uh, under the Mauryan uh, Empire uh, at around the time of the Chinese unification, then under the Guptas in about the second, third century BC, then finally under foreign conquerors, the Mughals uh, that come from uh, the Middle East or Afghanistan, and then finally by uh, the British. But the default condition of Indians uh, or Indian society is to be uh, a disunified uh, group of princely you know, states or you know, very powerful village communities that resist uh, the penetration by a strong state. And the reason for this, I argue, is actually religion because uh, you know, the Chinese don't have a religion you know, in, in, in certain ways. Uh, the Indians uh, have a, a Brahmanic religion that structures their society into castes or jatis or varnas uh, that makes it very, very resistant to outside uh, political pressure. So when the Chinese decide that they're going to build the Three Gorges Dam, uh, you know, this huge engineering project on the Yangtze River, it involves moving something like 1.2, 1.3 million people out of the floodplain. It takes them 10 years, but they just do it, you know, because they're an authoritarian state. Uh, there are no checks and balances. There's no legal action or anything that anyone can take uh, to prevent this from happening. So it just happens. Uh, if you remember a couple, maybe three years ago, in India, by contrast, the Tata Motor Company wanted to build a vehicle assembly plant in West Bengal uh, for this new nano car that they were going to create. And they got the permits and immediately faced strikes, you know, peasant uh, associations, lawsuits, uh, democratic politicians denouncing them for taking land uh, from peasants and the like. And finally, at the end of this process, they said, OK, we've had enough. We're going to you know, plop this somewhere else where we don't meet this kind of uh, organized resistance. So what's the difference? Well, India is a law-governed liberal democracy. People can protest. People can argue. There's a free press. Uh, they can organize. There's labor unions, right? And that prevents uh, you know, certain kinds of ruthless, rapid decisions that the Chinese can make uh, uh, very quickly. And that's one of the reasons why uh, China has, uh, you know, something like five times the amount of stored water per capita that India does, despite the fact that China is overall a drier uh, climate uh, than India, because they can do these really big infrastructure projects. Now, that may seem like a big economic advantage, and I think in the short run it has been. But what it means is that in Chinese society, uh, there's much less buy-in to any particular decision that the government makes simply because the government really does not have to respect you know, the wishes of, of individuals in that society. Now, I want to conclude just by talking a little bit about China and the United States. Uh, one, of the, one of the themes in this book is the theme of political decay uh, because all societies are susceptible to political decay. And by political decay, I mean one of two things. Either you create a certain set of institutions for one set of world conditions, and then the world changes around you, and you don't adapt the institutions, because human beings worship their own institutions. Institutions are unbelievably conservative. They're very, very hard to change. You imagine changing the American Constitution at this point in any really 
fundamental way. It's just politically uh, out of the question, all right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons that the Mamelukes decayed. They couldn't adopt gunpowder and, you know, other military innovations. Uh, the Chinese themselves, when the dynasties fell, uh, it usually was because of this accumulation of rigidities like the failure to, in the, in the late Ming uh, dynasty, to raise taxes sufficiently to pay for their own uh, defense against the, uh, uh, the Manchus, all right? Uh, the other source is patrimonialization. Every society, uh, in particularly a long period of peace and prosperity, will see the accumulation of power by the rich and the powerful. Uh, they will do everything they can basically to protect the interests of their children, their friends, their families, and so forth. And again, you see this repeated uh, uh, pattern. In fact, in France, in the old regime, I tell this in a uh, story in, in the chapter on old regime France, uh, it got to the point where every important office in France was actually auctioned off to the highest bidder, including the office of finance minister. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, the kinds of uh, problems with uh, corruption uh, that this, um, uh, that this uh, produced. So I don't think that simply the fact that we are a successful or have been a successful liberal democracy in the United States means that we will always be a, uh, a uh, successful political order uh, going on uh, into the future. And so I guess one of the questions that you know, I cannot answer definitively, and which I think you need to think about is something like the following. China, over the last 20 years, has really done pretty well. And in fact, since the financial crisis, the, what now unfortunately looks like the first leg of this extended financial crisis, uh, since that hit uh, three, four years ago, uh, the Chinese have actually been roaring ahead. They've still got very close to double-digit growth, although that is beginning uh, to decline. Part of the reason that they can do this is that they're an authoritarian government. They don't have checks and balances. They don't have lawsuits. They don't have a Supreme Court. They don't have uh, democratic accountability. Therefore, they can put in high-speed rail, beautiful uh, airports, uh, highways, all sorts of uh, public infrastructure much faster than, you know, so we're in Palo Alto still waiting for this high-speed rail to someday show up, you know, in our neighborhood. Lots of luck. I'll leave that when I see it. Uh, otherwise, you know, given that we're broke in any case, I'm not quite sure who's going to pay for that, but Chinese have managed to do all of this, right? Uh, if you think about our current situation in the United States, uh, I think we're at the other end of the scale. Uh, we Americans have, from the beginning, prided ourselves in the fact that we have a constitutional system that enshrines uh, a whole set of checks and balances because we distrust concentrated government power. But I would say right now that that system of checks and balances has led to complete paralysis when you combine that with a political culture that's highly uh, polarized, not civil, where people you know, have this intense distrust you know, between left and right of each other and also of the government itself, uh, it leads to things like the, uh, you know, the debt ceiling crisis that we all, this wonderful event that we all lived through uh, over the summer where we've got these very serious long-term fiscal problems uh, Actually, as a technical matter, they're really not that hard to figure out how to uh, deal with if you had the appropriate uh, political will. But the political system is so blocked at the present moment uh, that it cannot get to these decisions, all right? And so in many respects, I mean, Tom Friedman has been saying this for the last you know, several years. In a lot of respects, you know, the Chinese, quite frankly, look like they're doing better than us, right? And so the question is, uh, which of these systems in the long run uh, is actually going to prove the more durable. And here, I would actually say, despite all of our present problems and the dysfunctions that uh, seem to exist in our system, I would say that ours is going to do better. Or, or I would still bet on a system uh, um, of checks and balances, despite the fact that uh, that doesn't work so well at every given historical moment. Uh, and I think the Chinese really have a lot of long-term problems. One problem that they haven't figured out how to fix is what they call the bad emperor problem. Uh, because if you have concentrated autocratic power with no checks and balances, every now and then, you know, it's great when you've got a benevolent despot running your country. And I think the Chinese Communist Party has done a pretty good job in terms of economic development over the past 30 years. But you get some lunatic in there, like Mao Zedong, whom 
I think a lot of Chinese would actually identify as their last bad emperor, and that person can do unbelievable damage to that uh, society. The Cultural Revolution in China absolutely scarred every single Chinese that, that, that lived through that, and that is not something that can happen in a democratic society that has um, uh, rule of law. I think there's other things. Um, if you follow this story about the high-speed rail accident that happened over the summer in China, you know, this is one of their signature big infrastructure projects. They've set, spent several hundred billion dollars on this rail system. Uh, there's this big accident, and the first thing that happens is the railroad ministry buries the, <laughs> buries the train so that nobody can actually look at, look at it and see what the problem was. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it speaks to a system you know, if, if the system cannot even permit an open discussion of what caused this major, you know, accident, uh, you're never going to fix it. You're never going to get the incentives right so that this kind of thing won't happen uh, again. And so I think, uh, despite our current problems, uh, political problems right now, I do think that, you know, our kind of democratic system does definitely deliver better performance over a long period of time. Uh, however, in order to get to that long-term future, you've got to survive the present, and that's going to be an uphill challenge. So uh, I think with that, I'm going to stop talking, uh, and I'm uh, very happy to have any questions or comments that, that you might have about what I've said. So thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. So, hello. Yes. Yeah, so we are going to have microphones left and right for those who'd like to ask some questions, and uh, please let them be questions. If I might, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Fukuyama for a truly uh, wonderful intellectual tour de force. This was really very interesting. Um, as someone who has been accused of being closer to the primate origins of human behavior, <laughs> I might say that your remarks about the evolution and the movement towards a higher, um, higher level of, of, of behavior and accomplishment was a source of great comfort. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the program is now in your hands. We ask one thing, that you ask questions and don't make statements. And that way we have a greater opportunity to allow more people to bring their questions to the audience and to Dr. Fukuyama. Please, sir. Yeah, Dr. Fukuyama. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I noticed you didn't mention the Greek democracy as a precursor of the Western democracy. Uh, I would like some clarification on that. I I'm sorry. The, the Greek speak? democracy? Greek democracy. I don't think you mentioned that um, as a precursor. Yeah, well, I think that uh, obviously in European consciousness, the, the, the precedent of democratic Athens was obviously an extremely important uh, point of inspiration uh, for the democracies that emerged uh, there after the Renaissance and, and, and Enlightenment. Uh, however, if you actually ask why do you get democracy in England and the Netherlands, but not in Germany, not in France, not in Spain, and certainly not in Russia, the answer has nothing to do with Greek democracy because all of those countries were equally heirs to that same Athenian democratic uh, tradition. So if you say, well, why did democracy actually emerge in a particular country it actually has to do with this balance of power between centralized authority and people that are going to resist centralized authority. Mm -hmm. Same thing is going on right now in the Middle East. You know, you've had these Arab dictatorships, and if the people rise up and they're sufficiently cohesive, they can force uh, political change. And so, of course, uh, Athenian democracy is important as a point of reference that inspires people in the long run. But if you actually want to explain why do you get real-world political democracy in certain places, I think you need to go beyond that explanation and actually look at the balance of, of social forces. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, 
Um, hi. Uh, I, you, mentioned, you touched upon the rule of law as an important factor of modern states. And as of right now, China has what might be called more a rule by law. Right. My understanding has been that in order to have a properly functioning modern economy, the rule of law is very important. And I'm wondering if uh, this lack of the rule of law with, within China could, might affect its uh, political economic structure and if it, could, if it might provide certain pressures for political uh, right. change later on. Well, you know, the economists, as a matter of orthodoxy, argue that if you don't have property rights and contract enforcement uh, embedded in a Western-style legal system, uh, you're not going to get economic growth. And I just think that that proposition needs to be rethought because China has been growing like gangbusters, and they do not have that kind of a legal system. Uh, every single week, somewhere in China, some poor hapless peasant gets their land basically taken from them by a developer in cahoots with a party official, you know, and it leads to economic growth, but that's not Western-style property rights. Um, I think that the probably, so I think in the short run, that kind of legal system is actually not necessary to growth. Uh, I think, though, the question, again, it, it's like one of these long-term questions about the, you know, the bad emperor. Uh, at some point, because the party or people in power do not feel constrained by law, you know, right now they're making pretty good macroeconomic policy decisions, but, you know, at some point they don't have to, they don't have to follow rules, so they'll just go ahead and do what they want. There's already a very high degree of corruption uh, in China. They've managed to keep that uh, kind of, you know, it's not up to sub-Saharan African levels, you know, at the moment, but it could get there. And, and I think the, the absence of a real rule of law uh, would prevent that. Thank you. Next question, please. Oh, this uh, also on that side. Sorry. I apologize. I didn't see you there. Next question. So, uh, Dr. Fukuyama, do you believe there, there is a possibility for China at some point going through some kind of liberalization or democratization, or is that sort of very unlikely? Uh, <laughs> well, I actually had a uh, debate in Shanghai over the summer with Zhang Weiwei, who's uh, this guy that's written a best-selling book about the China model and takes this very nationalistic you know, government line uh, that China is a different cultural system, will never democratize, and so forth. Uh, I think that the critical issue is the Chinese middle class because, you know, one of the things that happens when you become middle class, and by that I mean you get, you know, more of an education, you know, uh, especially a, a, a university education, you begin to own property, uh, you're more technologically connected with the outside world. Uh, I believe that that induces people to want to participate in, uh, you know, in politics. And that's exactly what's been going on in, in the Arab world, uh, you know, in, in the Arab Spring. The Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions were led by exactly that kind of, sort of rising middle class uh, individual. And, you know, this Zhang and, and a lot of Chinese say, oh, no, the Chinese are different, you know, culturally they respect authority and they'll never uh, do that. I just do not believe this. I just don't believe this. You look at young Chinese and the way they think and act, and I think at a certain point, uh, you know, that desire to not be ruled over and have your dignity completely uh, disregarded by public authorities is, is going to come out. Right now, no, I'd say, because the government's very successful, lots of economic growth, stability, people still remember being poor, uh, people remember still the turmoil of, of the Cultural Revolution, so they don't want to rock the boat, but, you know, the Chinese are not going to grow at 10% forever. Uh, and, and at a certain point, that economy begins to slow down, you know, they make mistakes, and I think, you know, at that point, there's, a gonna, there's gonna be a critical juncture, and I think a lot of weaknesses that we don't see in that political system will, you know, then come to the fore, and I think there will be an opportunity for greater democracy there. Sir. For several decades, uh, the social statistics pertaining to the United States have been pretty dismal by high income modern democracies, one in general, and second more particularly, for centuries, not decades, the levels of violence have been also extremely high. Are these good examples and models to follow 
for the emerging and the others? And why is that? And what do you suggest can be done about that? Um, well, <laughs> one of my great uh, uh, mentors was Seymour Martin Lipset, the sociologist who taught for many years at Stanford and was my colleague at George Mason. Uh, and we taught his book, American Exceptionalism, together. Uh, and <clears throat> Lipset uh, argued, you know, the Republicans have been using American exceptionalism as an entirely positive uh, thing, but Lipset said American exceptionalism is a double-edged sword. Uh, it has good aspects and it has bad aspects. And uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics that makes the United States different, let's say, from most European uh, industrial democracies is Americans have a much greater distrust of government but also authority in general and so they don't like to follow rules and one of the consequences of that Lipset argued was that uh, you know our crime rates haven't always been high so they go up and they go down and so they were you know low in the 20s and they went up in the 30s they fell in the 50s 60s and they began to go up and they've been coming down steadily ever since they peaked in about you know, 1990 or, or 91, but they're always higher than, than most European countries. Uh, but Lipset's argument was, but, you know, that's just the flip side of Steve Jobs, who passed away yesterday, you know, that you wouldn't have this entrepreneurial culture if everybody just said, okay, we're going to line up and not cross the street, except when the, you know, even though there's no cars here, we're only going to cross when the, you know, the signal turns green. So Americans violate rules all the time. Sometimes there are these supposed rules about what you can and can't do with computers. And, you know, a lot of times that leads actually to a lot of innovation and risk-taking and, you know, stuff like that, that that everybody thinks is good. And so I think, you know, that's what the American model is. Uh, you got to take the good stuff with the bad stuff. So, yes, we have higher divorce and crime and illegitimacy and a lot of other social problems. We could deal with some of that if we were more serious about social policy. But, but I do think that it is, in a certain sense, culturally related uh, to the fact that we like to take risks more, we are more distrustful of authority, therefore less likely to kowtow to authority, and that also has some, you know, some benefits. Please. Yes, thank you. Um, do you think that the relatively new corporate feudalism that's developing in the, in the world in general, how will that affect what carries on into the future? Well, I think that that is, um, I guess it depends what you mean by corporate feudalism. Um, what I perceive follow, uh, happening is that as a result of technological advance uh, and globalization, uh, the economic base of the uh, middle class, not just in this country, but in most advanced democracies, is eroding. Uh, so if you look at where the gains to uh, uh, productivity have gone, or technology, over the last, you know, really 40, 50 years, uh, they are increasingly going to a very narrow group of people, which is either Wall Street or Hollywood, Silicon Valley, uh, and the like. And there's been this stagnation of middle class wages, which, you know, for white males actually peaked sometime in the 1970s. Now, we've managed to hide this from ourselves because we now have two income families and Actually, I think the whole subprime crisis was a covert way of doing redistribution because our society doesn't like the word redistribution, so we did it through subsidizing mortgages, and that's all come, uh, you know, that's all come crashing down. Uh, and you know, we make it worse by some of our our policies, and in in particular, you know, <laughs> I actually think we kind of let the Chinese deindustrialize us over the last, you know, ten years. We didn't try to, you know, we could have done a lot more to stop that, uh, uh, and now I think it's almost uh, uh, too late. And so here we've ended up with this post-industrial services economy in which, you know, people with a lot of brains and, and high skill can just make out like bandits. You know, so this one amazing statistic that the top 1% of American families in 1970 took home 9% of GDP, and by 2007 they're taking home like 24%, right? Uh, so it's a very, very dramatic shift in the distribution of wealth in this country. And I think that democracy everywhere rests on having a broad and large middle class. And so if you are moving into a world in which that middle class 
you know, really doesn't, you know, have a, a way of making a living, you've got a lot of problems. And, um, you know, I think that there are things that you can do with that, but I don't think that actually anyone has formulated, you know, a good answer to this that actually would yield effective policies that will, you know, uh, prevent the, you know, the further erosion of, of, of middle class incomes. Your question, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. I would like to know um, how you understand the legalist philosophers from the Warren estate period mm -hmm. in relation to this lack of uh, law yeah. of the Chinese history that you mentioned. It. Yeah, okay, so as a matter of background, one of the big um, ideological battles in ancient China was bec between the Confucians and the legalists. And, you know, the Confucians were in a sense very conservative, um, wanted to resurrect all of these family traditions of respect for ancestors and for parents, and the legalists were just these really tough-minded, you know, Machiavellians who said it's all about power. Uh, and the legalists are called the legalists because they believe that the state actually ought to not rely on morality, it should set laws, and so they have all these laws that are basically these big schedules of punishments, like slicing off people's noses and ears and, you know, cutting them into pieces for all sorts of little uh, infraction, so it was, you know, Taliban-style, you know, uh, harshness to it. But it was, you know, at least they, they believed that you had to have rules about, you know, in order to make society work. But in my book, that's not the rule of law because these are all rules that are laid down by the emperor. You know, they don't apply to the emperor uh, himself. And as I said, I think the rule of law is not the rule of law unless it is constraining on the people that hold, you know, the highest degree uh, of power, and so that's why, you know, I think that legalism was just, you know, it's an improvement over not having law at all, but it's, I don't think it rises to what I would consider to be the rule of law. Your question, please. Um, you give America as an example of a country where it is fairly easy for individuals to stop things from happening. Um, I've, I've heard that elsewhere. In fact, I've heard people say that uh, something like a parliamentary system might be more effective and that it would have fewer veto points. Yeah. Is, is that something you would agree with, or um, more generally, are there examples of intermediate levels of representationalism, and, and what are their prospects? Well, just by accident, I've just drafted an article on this very point, <laughs> which will be appearing uh, in my own journal, The American Interest, that uh, was referred to uh, in the next issue. Yes, because, uh, I mean, this is a kind of technical point among comparativists, but uh, you know, you have all sorts of different democratic systems, and you can characterize them by how many veto points or veto players they have. And if you look at the American system compared to a lot of European ones, we are way over at the far end of how many uh, uh, actors in our political system can stop things from happening. Uh, so the comparison is not with just any parliamentary system, but with the Westminster system which was the classic one that was used in, in Britain. It really doesn't exist anywhere in a pure form. But basically, there's no separate president, separately elected president. There's no federalism. There's no judicial review. And basically, 50% plus one in parliament can overturn any, you know, it can make any rule in, in the country. So if you look at the budget process, uh, when the prime minister, you know, is elected in a first-past-the-post system with party discipline, uh, usually, this is, you know, the coalition right now with Cameron and the, and the uh, Liberal Democrats is very unusual, uh, kind of a historical fluke. But most British uh, prime ministers have a very solid parliamentary majority. And you have any idea how long it takes to pass a British budget once the prime minister announces it? It's like a day or two, you know? I mean, because the parliament just passes it. I mean, the budget is formed by the government and the parliament just passes it. Whereas our budget process, uh, the president announces what he wishes would be the budget, and then 535, you know, legislators go to work, you know, grinding this thing up, carving out tax exemptions and subsidies and all these special perks, and there's really very little hierarchical discipline, you know, uh, inserted into this. And I think one of the consequences of this particular way of making sausages is that's what allows all these interest groups then to embed themselves because they capture, you know, certain congressional committees and you know, they carve out exceptions for themselves, and it's almost impossible uh, to get rid of them. And so I actually think that 
you know, this super committee idea that came out of the debt ceiling crisis uh, sort of points the way, I mean, I, we're never going to adopt a British style Westminster system, but what we could do is have a system like the base closing commission or the fast track authority that we use to pass free trade re uh, legislation where the 535 members of Congress give up their individual veto power uh, over you know, the budget. Uh, they turn it over to a much narrower, smaller, and more technocratic uh, committee, and then Congress has to vote the thing up or down as a package, and they cannot you know, add completely non-germane you know, riders and amendments to, you know, to, to things. And I just don't see how you're going to get a reasonable budget through unless you have a, you know, you move to this kind of a institutional system. You know, among the other, I think, idiotic things about our system right now, all hundred senators can put a hold on any appointment of any assistant secretary anywhere in the executive branch. And so there are, you know, Obama administration officials that <laughs> just got their appointments, you know, three years into his presidency because, uh, you know, because of this, this uh, veto. So of course, the, I mean, the Democrats did this to the Republicans when the shoe was on the other foot just as well. So it works, you know, in, in both uh, systems. So I, I do think that we've got a lot of problems with the institutional rules that we make decisions under, and we would actually be better served by a different set of rules. Please, sir. Uh, sir, um, now I'm wondering, uh, in regards to how we survive the present, I'm wondering what role the, uh, the private Federal Reserve uh, uh, serves, and it's kind of open-ended question, serves in our ability to survive the present, in polarization of wealth, in the decrease in middle cl class, which you say our, you know, our, gov our government is so dependent on. Thank you, sir. What, what role did the Federal Reserve play? What, what, role, what role does the Federal Reserve play in, uh, in, 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 in our country today? <laughs> well, uh, I think that all of the kind of populist suspicions about the Federal Reserve are, you know, broadly speaking, not, not right. That, that Bernanke, you know, for example, in the crisis, for the most part, did the right thing. There are some particular decisions that I think are questionable, like the AIG bailout, you know, like why they didn't force the, you know, <clears throat> all the counterparties in that particular one to take a a haircut is, is something that probably, I think, reflects, you know, the closeness of, you know, of Paulson and Bernanke and, and Geithner to, you know, to the Wall Street people. So in that respect, you know, I think there's some, uh, you know, there, there's some reasonable um, unhappiness with their performance. But if, if you ask the question, would I rather have this kind of technocratic, independent central bank or would I like the bank uh, controlled by Congress uh, or by public opinion to a greater extent? I'd say absolutely I'd prefer the former because, you know, <laughs> we've just had too much history in the world of politicized central banks and they just never, you know, they never make good policy. They, 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 just, don't, uh, they just don't do it. Hey, please. Um, quick question. Um, for the last... Um, many years, uh, democracy has been aligned with a uh, uh, nation state. And uh, now the new trend uh, is the regional blocs, the EU, European Union is coming up. Uh, the question is, how does democracy uh, realign with this new arrangement, especially with people yeah. not voting directly for those people and not having uh, what we call um, checks and balances right. on those right. organizations? Also, you also mentioned uh, uh, the US system being slow and inefficient. Um, mm -hmm. with a globalized economy whereby there's a race of the rest, China, India coming up, uh, you need a government that's more agile, yeah. that can respond to things much quicker. Where does that live the U.S. in a world whereby other countries can adjust right away, European countries can do that, and the U.S. is still slow and in many ways uh, uh, inefficient? Well, uh, no, that's a great question. I mean, this is obviously one of the things that everybody's been wondering about because we live in this globalized world where you know, something that goes on in one part of the world has a big impact on people, you know, thousands of miles away, and there are no political institutions of accountability that, you know, uh, allow the, the people at the receiving end to have any, you know, say in the decisions that, that, that affect them. And that's, of course, what drove people crazy in the Bush administration, that, 
You know, they launched the war in, in Iraq, and you know, a lot of people around the world didn't like it, but they couldn't do anything because they were not American voters, and they couldn't vote against President Bush and, and, and so forth. Uh, and I uh, think that the solution to this is really dif very difficult, because I just don't see that we're going to get anywhere close to, you know, real-world government anytime soon. And in fact, you know, this crisis now in the e EU, the, you know, so this is the one part of the world that has come the closest to actually abandoning traditional state sovereignty in favor of something different. And they are absolutely at this big fork in the road right now, where either the euro is going to fall apart, and probably not the EU itself, but certainly the euro has a good chance of falling apart, or they've got to deepen it, you know, and turn this into a fiscal union in addition to just a, a monetary union. They cannot, they cannot fail to make that decision. They just, you know, they can't muddle through uh, in the middle course. Um, I mean, if I had to bet, uh, I would bet that, you know, it would fall apart because I'm, I'm not sure the political will there is there for, you know, the deepening thing. And so if the EU can't get to, you know, this kind of larger unit, uh, it's going to be very hard for other parts of the world that didn't have that common experience of this, you know, the two world wars to actually have the, you know, the, the, the political will to, to create these, uh, uh, these units. So I think, I mean, this is what I wrote about in, in my last book on foreign policy. Probably the, the, what you need to hope for is this patchwork world where you don't have a single dominant uh, multilateral organization, but you have you know, a whole set of overlapping and sometimes competing organizations that are partly regional, partly functional, organized according to different principles that take care of very specific problems that come up uh, that, you know, allow people to cooperate and, you know, produce some degree of accountability, but not put all your eggs in, in the basket of a single organization that's going to do everything for you. Uh, and that's, you know, maybe someone in the audience has a better idea, but <laughs> my thinking just gets stuck at this point, and I, I don't really see, you know, what kind of alternative you're going to have to that. Please. Thanks. Um, Military interventions in the last decade have created a, a kind of policy problem because you're trying to fast track a thousand years of history and create political order in 10 to 15 years so you can get the heck out of that country if it's Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, so I just wondered, you seem to be kind of talking about in the European record that the rule of law, um, some level of independence for the judiciary is, is kind of comes prior to the other two organs of government. And I just wondered if you thought if you were trying to advise an intervening force uh, about how they should fast track to political order, are you saying that the rule of law, independent judiciary, they're more important perhaps than the other two? Um, well, you know, this is a generic set of questions about sequencing. So you want a strong state, you want rule of law, and you want democracy. Uh, and, you know, in Europe, uh, they didn't all happen at once. They, they came first rule of law, then the state, then democracy. And this occurs over many, many centuries, right? And so here we're going to a place like Afghanistan uh, and saying, no, you need all three of these all simultaneously. And, you know, it's not going to happen. So the logical question is, if you have to pick, you know, where do you start? And it would be nice if you could start with rule of law. But, you know, what, what, do you, what does it take to create a rule of law institution? You gotta train judges, you gotta train lawyers, you gotta have a bar, you gotta pay for a court system. You know, all of this stuff is incredibly expensive, but it's also the work of, you know, two or three generations. And in the meantime, you've got a state that's falling apart, that's got the Taliban and drug dealers and, you know, all of this stuff. And so I think that's probably not, you know, even though the Europeans began that way, uh, that's not the way you're gonna begin in a place like Afghanistan. So what they've been trying to do is just get a state there, you know even if it's not pretty or democratic or, or whatever, just get a state. And it's proving that that's too much. Uh, so I am fairly pessimistic about you know, what's going to happen. Now, there are other countries where you have much more to build on, because Afghanistan has got to be one of the, the hardest cases you could ever you know, imagine uh, uh, dealing with, um, you know, where you actually, for example, have a state. So Egypt doesn't have that problem. Egypt's got a state. Uh, there the question is building the judicial and, and accountability institutions that will actually constrain the army and the, you know, uh, the core of the state that, that's already there. Please. 
Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was fascinating. Actually, you just touched on my question. I was wondering, um, what are your thoughts on the Arab Spring? Why did it happen precisely now and not 10 years ago or 10 years from now? And where do you see states like Libya and Egypt and Syria 10 years from today? <laughs> that was a really easy question. Okay, so the... <laughs> In two minutes. So the first question, I, there's no answer to that. You know, why did it happen this year? I have no idea. And I don't think we're ever going to, you know, particularly know why the specific timing. Uh, however, I do think that it is related to modernization because I think that this kind of revolution really is brought about by, um, you know, middle class people uh, who have access to Facebook and Twitter and they have education and they know what's going on in the outside world. And I, as I was saying, I don't think that that kind of person likes living under uh, your average disrespectful, you know, military uh, regime. Uh, so I think that's the long run, you know, question. And if you look at Egypt and Tunisia particularly, they, uh, they've actually done pretty well in terms of education over the past uh, generation. So, you know, that it happened is not a surprise. That it happened in 2011. I, who the hell knows why, you know, that. Where they're going to be, again, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think um, they've all got a tough, uh, job, I think the Tunisians probably have the best chance of those three. I have no idea where the Syrians are going to be. I think Egypt is going to, I don't think they've had a democratic transition, honestly, yet. Uh, and so that's going to take, you know, quite a few more years. The Libyans, you know, are starting off without a state, because uh, Gaddafi didn't, you know, leave that to them. And so they've got to build that at the same time that they build all the other stuff. And that's actually a lot more challenging. So. So this is a long-winded way of saying, I don't know any, any of the answers to the questions that you posed. Uh, but it was a good question. It was a good question, yes. Please. My initial question got mostly answered. Uh, uh, please speak into the mic, thank you. Uh, my initial question mostly got answered beforehand, but maybe you can elaborate on um, as far as your um, idea of um, political origins go. Uh, is the European Union um, a historically sensible development? I mean, what, what's its position um, in, the, um, in, in the line? No, I mean, the, the logic, the political and economic logic of the European Union is impeccable. Uh, I, <laughs> I was at a meeting at the Vatican uh, on the very day that the Eastern Europeans were led into the EU. And it was a very touching moment because there was... Hans Tietmeier would have been the head of the Bundesbank, and there were a couple of high officials uh, from Poland and, uh, and the Czech Republic, and all three of them had served in their respective countries' militaries, and they had fought against each other, you know, in the Second World War. And now they're all, you know, guys in their 70s, 80s, and they're sitting together celebrating the fact that, you know, that Poland had just been led into the EU, and it was a very, very moving moment. And so, you know, and, and unfortunately, the younger people in Europe don't, you know, not having lived through the war, they don't quite understand why, you know, this, this thing is being put in place. The economic logic of it is... My, the, my case, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, and the economic logic of it, you know, makes sense as well. It just wasn't well designed because, you know, they... They let in countries that didn't actually meet the criteria, and then there's no disciplining mechanism and no way for them to uh, get out again. And so Greece took advantage of this, and so there you're in this current situation. Uh, so as I said, I think that's why the thing is either, either the euro has to, you know, people have to start exiting the euro. Like for the Greeks, it's just hard to see how they're ever going to grow again unless, you know, unless they do that. Uh, or they've got to deepen the union to the point where you're going to have fiscal discipline uh, so that another Greece couldn't happen, and then the Germans have got to pony up enough money to really solve the question. And, and I, you know, your guess is as good as mine, which of those forks they go down. And... Please, sir. Thank you. As the population of the planet continues to increase, uh, how do you think uh, societies, countries, and their political institutions are going to be affected, or how are they going to react as more and more countries are facing shortages of fresh water, uh, the ability to produce enough food, 
all complicated by climate change. <laughs> well, not well. <laughs> That's a tall order, you know. <laughs> I mean, climate change is one of those really, really tough uh, problems in international cooperation because the upfront costs of dealing with it are high. The impacts of your behavior affect a lot of other people other than people that live in your country. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to free ride on the actions of, of other people. And so I think that's why you didn't get a real, you know, progress in Copenhagen. And, uh, you know, so I think we're kind of dependent on uh, some deus ex machina technological innovation that will somehow allow us to get away from all these coal-fired plants and so forth. Because I think politically, uh, you know, it's going to be really tough uh, to solve that. Uh, the population thing is complicated because actually for a good half of the world, the problem is actually going to be declining population, right? Uh, every developed country led by Japan, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, are all facing almost catastrophic declines in population and aging. And that's also uh, a problem that no one has ever had to deal with, short of war and plague and, you know, uh, uh, events of that sort. Um, and again, I don't have a good, <laughs> I don't have a good way of dealing with that one either. Time to write another book. <laughs> Someone else can write that one. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for a very insightful lecture. I have just two. Uh, please speak into the mic, sir. Thank you. Two brief things, two short things to ask. One that, uh, with reference to Middle East countries, you said that uh, they are not democratic uh, because they don't need to pay any taxes, etc., etc. But I, th uh, you know, like my question is the, the same is the situation. Like for example, uh, in China or in some other dictatorship, uh, where they are dictatorship, but they need to collect taxes, but they haven't become democratic because of yeah. this reason. And second thing which I, which is coming to my mind that from your uh, talk, one can get an impression, at least indirectly, that as if uh, the religious government are democratic or at least potentially democratic. But I think religious government are in fact in a very subtle way, very uh, dictatorial. So these two things I have. Uh -huh. Well, on the first question, so the, the issue was, I said that collecting taxes promotes democracy as opposed to just collecting oil rents. And he said, uh, but that doesn't always happen because a lot of authoritarian countries collect taxes. Yes, that's true. Uh, so it's not a perfect correlation. Uh, and even in the case of England, you know, which started this whole tax revolt, uh, it took you know, a century of struggle before they established the principle no taxation without representation. But at least if the government is forced to extract taxes from its population, at least they've got some leverage over the government. Uh, I was just in Nigeria last week, and this is a country that basically, it, it, the whole thing revolves around sharing oil revenues, you know? They don't collect any taxes at all. Uh, and so that's the source of the corruption, you know, this, this kind of miserable level of, of governance they've got there. Uh, and if they actually didn't have oil and had to collect taxes, I think that they would be a much happier, you know, and more successful uh, society at the present moment. Uh, Dr. Fukuyama, uh, so a uh, couple of technological questions. You talked uh, about technology in the last one for solving climate change. We might not have the information uh, there yet to, for that kind of technology. But uh, first question is WikiLeaks. Uh, to what extent do you think that it changes the game of political order uh, now and going forward? And uh, uh, also with regard to the exchange of information, what do you think the prospects are for creating forms of political order by the medium of the internet. Okay, so on WikiLeaks, I have two seemingly contradictory opinions. First opinion is I think the government should be allowed to discuss things in private, because, <laughs> you know, with foreigners, with each other, because otherwise you're just not going to get frank conversations. But secondly, I think the government classifies way too much stuff, you know, and if you've ever worked in the government, you just see, I mean, all these bureaucrats are just you know, covering their rear ends by stamping secret on so many documents. They don't need to do this. And so you could actually have a substantially more open, and actually was interesting, because of WikiLeaks, I think the State Department actually in certain ways 
despite all the embarrassing things that were revealed, they actually came out pretty good because people read these tables and say, hey, these foreign service officers actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> Uh, and they're actually of serving course. the interests of the country and, you know, and so forth. Uh, so, I, so I think both that you need more, you, you just got to get rid of many of these layers of secrecy and you know, the government has got to assume that you know, it can send cables about a whole lot of things and, and talk about this and have it get in the papers and that's fine. But I do think that there is a realm of you know, discussions where they do need to keep secrets and so you need both of those.